place again. So on next, uh, on next, uh, we're going to have um our brother Robson from uh, Kenya present on behalf of our sister Anna Karina um from Mozambique. Yes, so brother Robson, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. I hope you can hear me also. Yes, I can hear you. My apologies, uh, everyone. Uh, there's a bit of noise on my background. I made the cough shop, so bear with me. But uh, you can go ahead, uh, Brother Rupson, and present on the upper house, Sister Anna Karina from Mozan. Okay, I'm Minga Robson Mogaka. I'm going to present on behalf of Anna Karina from Mozambique. Uh, the Mozambique report, dated from 4th April 2022 to 9th April 2022. Country weekly activities. Activities to protect black people from racism and xenophobia. Mozambique is a state uh, of alert uh, against uh, xenoph xenophobic attack against uh, Mozambians, Mozambicans, Im Mozambican immigrants. Despite the fact that we didn't, uh, we didn't, we didn't hear of any rumor or information uh, related to the issue. The country is still in the middle of a uh, rainy season and it's been sever uh, severely affected by Synclone, Anna and uh, Kaba Kabatsira, and now Gombe in the north. Because of that, it, it was declared a state of emergency in the country. War, war crisis in Ukraine. We obtained registration, uh, registration of 15 Mozambicans, most of them students who, fl who fled to Ukraine. Four, four are already in, in Mozambique and the rest are distributed between Poland and Finland. Mozambique. Uh, refrained from condemning Russia for the war in Ukraine, but the African Union uh, condemned the atrocities against the U uh, Ukrainian people. Shared the weekly task uh, for the I Love Black People members and ambassadors. Shared the I Love Black People up safe places to help protect people uh, from the from the racial discrimination the community members from different countries were asked to prepare write and submit weekly reports it was shared it was shared it was shared the 45th weekly newsletter highlighting highlighting the i love black people up safe places shared the weekly tasks shared the pan african history uh, studied saturday call shared the pan african community call with our uh, with our special guest Ty tyrene Wright and uh, and the and the queen mother nana akua zenzele announcements were made to the call member to announcements were made to call members to volunteer as ambassadors for i love black people the community members and ambassadors from the different countries were asked to prepare write submit weekly reports share the i love black people uh, actions uh, and rules containing the bio mission goals and activities covid-19 updates in mozambique report at uh, report on uh, 8th april 2022 tracked tests 7,528,708 entrance tests 7,528,708 Performed test 
3,352 tested positive, 225,277 tested negative, 1,076,075 death, 2,200 recoveries, 223,047. Quarantine, zero. Uh, source, na, uh, source of all this information, National Institute of Health. COVID-19 uh, situation in Mozambique considered stable yet. In, in states of alert, uh, reported by Minga Robson Mogaka on behalf of Anna Karina from Mozambique. I am because we are Ubuntu. I am because we are Ubuntu. I thank you so much, our brother Robson, for presenting on behalf of our sister Anna Karina from Mozambique. We appreciate you. Again, I would like to welcome those who just joined us. I welcome to all of the people of Pan African History Plus. We appreciate you. We are looking forward to learn more today on your lectures as well as the Pan African History Organizing Class. Uh, we welcome you again and we thank you for joining. Again, today we are going to discuss more about our application, uh, which is a great tool. We should not take it lightly. Let's download it, use it, to recommend more safe places for Black people. Even if you are in Ghana, South Africa, Zambia, Brazil, Lesotho, we, are, we greatly need uh, you to identify those places whereby black people are treated with dignity and respect. And let the whole world know that uh, there are such places which exist anywhere in the world. So we need them um, to, um, to recommend those places. I can see Ibrahim Fendi Konde uh, has raised uh, his hand. Kindly write um, your questions, your queries in the chat room. We can kind uh, we will assist you on that. So this application is mainly used um, to, to identify the safe places and um, recommending it to our fellow black people. So we encourage each and everyone to use it. So after a presentation by our, um, our developer, one of our developers, Yvonne Tushime from uh, Rwanda about the Alaska uh, safe places, we are going to hear from a youth selector about our uh, aid with Nana Akua. So stay tuned. And also the Pan-African History class uh, with Professor Dr. Shaivin Wright. Uh, she's a professor at the City of New York University in the United States. Uh, so stay tuned for today's program and invite more people, more friends, families to join this. Everything is for free. No man is needed. And also, um, you, you, they will attain a certificate. They will attain a certificate of... Uh, of completion after we're done with this lecture. Uh, so ne all, uh, upcoming next, I was going to have a uh, sister Yvonne Dushime from uh, Rwanda to present about the last exposure places. And we encourage each and every one of you to update the application to assist more features. And if you do have any features which you want to be on the application, kindly write in the chat room that you want this to be on our application. We for what each and every review to our developers to develop it the way you want it, because they are the ones who are helping us uh, to protect the people using technology. You are a team, we need to help each other. That's why you are their members and ambassadors in everyone you can access. All right, um, back to you, our sister Yvonne, can you introduce yourself and give us a presentation? Yes, uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, there, there are someone who is asking uh, about creating a group, a WhatsApp group. Uh, we already have one, maybe I want you can share the link. Uh, Give Sidai Kumpa. We already have a WhatsApp group. Uh, we are going to share the link with you. So as uh, my brother Awa said, my name is uh, Dushime Yvonne, and I'm uh, 
a database developer of I Love Black People. And uh, I'm Randan. Yes, yeah, so we are going, uh, I'm going to share my screen and show you how you can use the app to recommend uh, more black, uh, black friendly or safe places for black people. But also I will share, uh, I will show you how you can uh, even uh, <clears throat> uh, invite your friends and family also to join us because it's a good app and uh, we'll be able to protect each other I think since it's a good app, you have to also uh, invite your friends and family uh, to download and use the app. And also while I'm going through the app, I want, can you help me and uh, share the link, the links of uh, the apps? We have a uh, Android version and iOS version. So I'm going to start to share my screen. Okay, this is the app. Sorry. Okay, so uh, first of all, you have uh, to sign up. Let me use my name. To share. Mm -hmm. Okay, then phone number. I'm going to put a random phone number. Uh, address is uh, Kigali. Kigali, you can see that uh, already my current uh, location was there. It's random. Then password. <coughs> Okay, so already exists. Let me change it. Okay, the username is already exist. Let me change. Wait. Okay. Yes, I was able to sign up. Then I have to sign in. Yes, so this is the app. <clears throat> you can see our eight essential categories. Here on the top, there is accommodation, uh, beauty, education and child care, uh, finance, food, health, legal and transportation. So by going back to accommodation, you can see uh, 
here on the suggestion section. These are businesses that are around uh, my area. I'm in Kigari, Usororo. So these, these are the businesses around where I am. Let's check uh, beauty. We don't have any beauty business around here. Yes, education and child care, we only have one around where I am right now. And also you can check uh, the close by section. You can here on the search, you can search uh, maybe what category do you want to search businesses? But in the meantime, if you have uh, any question, you can just write it in the section, in the comment section, then I'll be able to answer it at the end of uh, the presentation. Yes, let's uh, maybe search for accommodation. Um, maybe Nairobi, Kenya. Yeah, so this is uh, the accommodation category businesses that are available in, in Kenya. And if I've uh, ever like uh, gone to one of these uh, places and they are black friendly, it means that they treat uh, black people with respect and dignity. All I have to do is uh, click here on like button. In that case, it means that um, I'm sure that this business is a safe place for black people. If I'm not sure, I can just click on uh, skip. I hope you can see the skip button here on the bottom. Then uh, like how can you invite your friends and family uh, to join? Uh, I mean, to download the app. You can see here on the bottom where it's written invite. You have just to click it. Then you can uh, either invite them using a message, text message or using WhatsApp. And they will receive this kind of uh, message where they can even download the app. Whether they are using uh, Android or iOS, because you have both versions, they'll be able to download the app if you share with them this message. Okay, so uh, that's our app and soon we'll be uh, adding uh, notifications where you'll be uh, maybe around uh, one of the businesses in our eight essential categories and then you will receive a notification that you can uh, add that business on the platform or if you're not sure about the business, if they are black friendly or not, please don't add it because you're trying to create like uh, uh, safe places for black people. And if you're not sure, no need to add that business on the platform. It's better to skip it and add the businesses that you're sure that they are black friendly or they, tr they treat black people with respect and dignity. Yes, I think that, that's all. That's all for the app. And uh, I can see a question, how can we access to it? I think they were asking about the app. We are going to share again the link for both Android and uh, iOS. Yes, uh, what, are there any other questions? Yes, um, I can see there are not um, uh, questions. There are no questions. But someone, but how can we access it? Are we going to share the link? And also about Domingo, if you were asking about the certificate, you need to join our partnership in class on WhatsApp. The link, uh, I think, the link was being shared. The mark um, send us this an action group link. So we encourage you as well to join the, the action group link. So again, uh, if uh, you want to have uh, anything to say. Yeah, I think that's all. And um, okay, I can see another question. 
because they are has different language traces. Uh, for now, it's only in English, but uh, I think moving forward, we have it uh, in different languages. Yeah, for now, it's only in English. Yes. Yes. Again, if you do have any features which you want to to include or or which you need us to include on our last day, because this application, please kindly send it in the chat room, and um, we will we'll notify all the developers about um your view about uh, these um issues. We also some um, recommendations like we should, we should include. Uh, a panic button or an emergency button on our application so that whatever someone faces uh, racism or xenophobia, they can use that button to raise awareness to near uh, members and ambassadors to get assistance. So we are in the, in the process of building the application and hopefully with your help, we will achieve what we want. In the meantime, let's use the application, identify uh, areas where we need to improve ourselves and also um, recommend more businesses about complicating the businesses uh, we do a survey about some um, from people who reside in, uh, in different areas all over the world asking them if they existed at the same business which was recommended and then we we do upload it as a safe place so if uh, the businesses are not safe we urge you not to like the businesses just keep using the application. That's why we need only focus on black people, whereby they only recommend businesses which are black friendly and are black owned. Yeah. So that's what we need. And we appreciate all of you with the work you are doing. I cannot like mention all of you who are a lot on this uh, meeting. Uh, I see if, uh, I see some people they join this meeting each and every Saturday. We appreciate all of you. Again, if it's your first time, welcome to our Pan African History class. We welcome you. We love you. We're trying to spread love to all the corners of the earth and also to make sure this world will be a safe place. Um, we identify a safe place for black people all over the world so that you, wherever you go, wherever you are, you have a place whereby you can go and feel like you are at home. Again, um, uh, we're going to share the link for the application for those who don't have the application. And um, the process uh, is simple, and the application doesn't uh, consume much um, space in your phone, and there's no data. It's uh, user-friendly. Uh, we have a lot of reviews on the Google and App Store. Kindly visit the Google Play Store and uh, App Store. Search for a lot of like, people safe places. It will pop up at the first time. Um, the first slot from the what we do. So on next, uh, we're going to have a Pan African um, youth class with uh, Nana Akua. So um, people, you should invite your friends and family so that uh, they can hear more about how to protect uh, themselves um, and also like uh, how to use help, our natural uh, helps and uh, remedies as black people we know we are strong, but we need also to use our own natural things to, for, for us to be more strong. And again, uh, there are issues are circulating around the world in South Africa, um, it's about uh, xenophobia. We make sure that uh, on our future meetings, we we'll discuss more about it. And our co-founder, Sakifufa Mapondera, uh, is going to resume about uh, critical issues around uh, Africa to give us a speeches around Africa as well, and also updates each and every one of you on how um, to tackle those issues. Um, we urge you to be safe wherever you are. Try to uh, recommend safe places for black people, ensure that family and friends, they are safe. And also uh, the coronavirus is not yet over. We are not uh, immune to the virus. Let's practice safety measures and also let's adhere to each and the country rules which are there. Here in Zimbabwe, we are still wearing face masks and uh, they are still like a few times. So we need to, uh, to adhere to those, uh, those rules for you, for us all to be safe. So uh, hopefully everyone is ready now for the Pan-African Yotke lecture with Nana Akua. 
and hopefully we'll be taking some notes and practice uh, in the future and also ask questions so that we can get assisted with Nana Akua. Yes, I can see him. Uh, it's uh, four minutes away, but um, Nana Akua is uh, with that. Yes, uh, Yvonne, can you unmute Nana Akua to give us um, Pan African history, uh, Pan African UK lecture? Good, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Yes, a uh, good, uh, good morning, Sanana uh, Akua. How are you? I am great. Hello, Yvonne. Hello, everyone. Manuel has his camera on. Yay! Thank you. And nobody else has their camera on. What is going on? Okay, Domingos. Thank you, Antonio. Yes. I love to see your faces. Thank you. Hey, Derry. Christopher. Oh, Siri, I'm not talking to you. Siri thinks I'm talking to her. I am not talking to you, Siri. Okay, Africa Beyond. Okay, Rafiq. Very good. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all. Thanks for indulging me. I love to see beautiful black faces. So good, good day, and welcome to the Pan Africa Ming uh, Minga. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Greetings, greetings. Oh, my time. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all. Welcome to the Pan African Health Care class. Uh, we are in our second week. Um, for this cycle. And so today we are talking about herbs and essential oils and homeopathic remedies and essential oils and superfoods and all of the wonderful things in terms of healing our bodies using God's medicine. And so I, uh, you may or may not know, I'm an herbalist first. I started out being an herbalist, making products and um, promoting healing through the use of herbs and food as medicine and natural products. You know, my concept is pretty much what you put on your body, you should be able to ingest and put inside of your body. So I'm very much into promoting natural skincare products, not uh, detergent based or, you know, chemical based cleansing products. Um, I'm really into as natural as possible, um, as clean as possible, uh, consumable items for our bath and body and beauty products. So I started out making um, everything, shampoo, um, teas, uh, encapsulated herbs, um, skin creams, ointments, liniments bath salts, just you name it. So there's so many uh, ways to use herbs. I wanted to make mention of that because usually we're focusing on what is the, um, I guess, uses for internal or medicinal health, um, but we can use herbals uh, for topical cleansing and beauty products as well. So I don't so much focus on that, but I wanted to highlight that. Um, body powder, you know, one of my biggest pet peeves is giving babies or using on babies, you know, talcum powder or baby, baby powder, quote unquote. Uh, but these things we know contain uh, talc, which is toxic and not good for infants. Uh, usually it's traced to respiratory issues, asthma and other, you know, bronchial issues and such. So there are even really simple ways to use um, something that will absorb moisture and cool the body, but without the towel. So you can use white clay and cornstarch or arrowroot and whatever essential oils to fragrance it with, whisk it, use that as your body powder, whether for an infant or whether for an adult. Um, but things that contain talc, for example, are toxic. And so that's not something that we really want to promote. And, uh, you know, we always think a baby smells a certain way like this, you know, synthetic baby powder smell. 
uh, but this is not what we know babies naturally smell like. So, you know, that's just one example of the many uses for herbals for our bath and body, you know, uses. Um, but I want to see if I can share my screen and I think I have it up. Okay, it's just scrolled down. So let me just scroll back up to the top here. So, you know, again, we'll talk about superfoods. We'll talk about um, essential oils and things of that nature, but we're going to start off talking about herbs. And I think I'd like to take a different approach today and maybe highlight certain conditions uh, as opposed to the handout that I usually go over where we discuss what the individual herbs do. I think I will focus on this side of the handout where it gives you traditional uses of herbs for uh, health complaints. Um, and what you can do is if you will in the chat, if there is an issue that you have a concern or question about and maybe want to know what herbs have been traditionally used for that, not that I am recommending <laughs> the use of those herbs to treat or cure any condition, but just from what the literature shows us and historically what it's been used for, we know that there are certain herbs that have a positive impact on um, different health conditions. Um, so let's start going through some of these that are listed here in this handout. And this was sent to you earlier this week. If you are in the current WhatsApp group, I think there are four or five uh, groups uh, currently for the Pan-African Healthcare on WhatsApp. So if some of you are online today, hopefully you've gotten a chance to go through this maybe you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll try to look at that a little sooner than later, sort of usually midway or closer to the end, I'll read the questions, but I'll try to see if you're putting in uh, health concerns or issues that you have. But let's just go through some that are listed here. So a lot of people suffer from allergies, hay fever, sinus problems, things of that nature. Oh goodness, I did something to... <laughs> I did something to make my, okay. I'm always hitting a button and then I can't see what I need to look at. But uh, if you're having allergy or sinus issues, what's listed here is echinacea and marshmallow root. These are herbs that have been traditionally used for allergy and hay fever. And of course, there are many others. Another that I really like here is an herb called nettle or stinging nettle. This is also really good for allergy and hay fever. And of course, there are many others. Uh, if you're suffering from anemia, low blood pressure, a lot of times this is characterized by people having low energy, kind of chronic fatigue, um, the shortness of breath, feel like you're kind of just out of shape and can't kind of do simple things like climbing a step or you know walking a certain distance. Some people will chew on ice or crave ice, um, but there are many, good herbs and foods to increase your iron. Alfalfa is one, dandelion is another. Nettle that I just mentioned is another one that I really like uh, for this as well. And then any liver uh, tonic herbs, of course, dandelion is one of those, but things like yellow dock and burdock, milk thistle, these are all good. If you're talking about foods, you might increase your beets. Um, uh, into your diet or increase your beet intake. Blackstrap molasses is excellent for uh, in anemia as well. Um, but any combination of those herbs that will treat the liver or cleanse the blood or enrich the blood are gonna help with that. Um, let's get down to arthritis. A lot of people have joint pain, inflammation, things of that nature. Um, let me just say a food tip with this one. If you suffer from arthritis or you know, chronic uh, inflammation, you want to decrease or eliminate if possible, uh, what we call nightshade vegetables. These are vegetables that grow right in the evening time or in the shade. And these are things like tomatoes, potatoes, bell peppers, eggplant, even tobacco. If you consume tobacco uh, in any form, these can increase inflammation in the body. 
but also herbs that help with arthritis and have anti-inflammatory properties are things like black cohosh, chaparral, feverfew. Uh, if you're talking about the pain of it, um, then, and we'll have a whole handout about pain uh, killing herbs, but things like um, uh, black haw, um, valerian, uh, meadow sweet, white willow bark, these are also good for arthritis. Um, bladder and urinary disorders. Uh, this is also a kind of big issue for a lot of people. It could be um, from women who've birthed children. A lot of times you develop bladder and urinary disorders, uh, whether it's from during pregnancy where, you know, as the baby's growing, there's pressure on the, the bladder. Uh, it could be after the fact from having pushed out a baby and uh, things not be exactly the same with your urinary tract. And then of course, most often, you know, you'll find a urologist doctor usually has males in it or men in it because that's a very common problem with men as you age that you uh, can develop certain urinary issues. And of course it ties in sometimes with the prostate. Um, so you'll have most urologists that see uh, older or aging men. Um, but there are many good things to do in this regard as well. Drinking water is always going to be a good option. Um, and doing foods that we'll talk about in week four to really cleanse and heal the kidneys. Um, cucumber, celery, lemon, things of that nature. But in terms of herbs, burdock, cranberries, golden seal, juniper, marshmallow root. And there are many others. Uh, Uva ursi. Buchu, um, the, you know, so there are a lot of herbs that heal the kidneys, the bladder, the urinary um, tract. Pressure, another issue in the Black community, definitely a big problem. I get uh, a lot of questions about, oh goodness, Lordy mercy, what did I do? <laughs> I'm always hitting some. I hope you couldn't see that. That was work. Um, blood pressure. So. Black community, a lot of times we're maybe not eating um, really healthy foods or get too heavy handed with some of our seasonings, especially salt or even these multi seasonings that also contain salt. Um, so if you're thinking you're getting some kind of, you know, multi season uh, uh, or season all, you have to be careful to not get ones where salt is the first ingredient because it is primarily salt and not the herbs and spices that perhaps you um, are looking for. Um, so be careful about what you consume in terms of your diet, but in terms of what herbs can help with high blood pressure, cayenne, garlic, hawthorn, passion flower, juniper berry, I would also add here, uh, there is a food supplement or what they kind of consider a vitamin, even though it's not technically a vitamin, but CoQ10 has also been useful with uh, high blood pressure. And then of course on the uh, opposite end, some people do suffer from low blood pressure, right? And so we know that sometimes this is due to circulatory issues and things of that nature. So dandelion and parsley can be excellent if you are dealing with low blood pressure. If I can, let me skip down a bit. You all know, well, cold, colds and infections, I will, let me not skip over that. So colds and infections, you know, echinacea, golden seal, this is a very popular combination, at least on, on this part or this side of the world. Um, you'll find them together a lot of times, but they work effectively apart as well. Um, but eyebright, garlic, um, and many others we know are really good for uh, colds and infections and such. So include those, but we also have other things like cardiaco, which is also a good immune booster, um, ginseng. Uh, so there are many other uh, herbs that are excellent for boosting the immune system. Colloidal silver, if you're in the WhatsApp group, I sent uh, some assignments, reading assignments yesterday, and I put several handouts about colloidal silver. And colloidal silver is ionized silver. 
um, where it boosts the immune system. So it's excellent for fighting infection. So not just bacterial, uh, but also viral, parasitic, yeast, you know, all sorts of uh, microorganisms that cause infection. So that can really boost your immune system and help fight off infections as well. And of course, we know certain vitamins and minerals are great for that, vitamin C, zinc, and so on. Um, so if you're talking about the cold and flu, or if you're talking about just infections in general, these are all herbs and supplements that are great for that. Uh, constipation, as you know, we will talk more about that in week uh, four. So we'll talk about how to cleanse the colon, how to move the colon, um, proper ways in which to eliminate your posture, all of that. We'll talk about how to do your best, most productive eliminating. But in terms of treating constipation with herbs, we know that there are several what we call stimulant herbs that are excellent for um, uh, treating constipation. Senna, Cascara Sagrada, um, but there are many others. There's aloe vera juice that's on the milder end. Um, you can use that internally that acts as a mild laxative. Um, there is uh, turkey rhubarb, um, slippery elm. So there are many uh, herbs that are great for constipation. Another uh, common illness in the Black uh, community is diabetes. And there's so much to say about this. We'll talk in, um, I don't know if that's week three or four, we will talk about one of the best ways to address diabetes from a food or eating or dietary standpoint when we talk about the glycemic index, but we also know that there are certain herbs that will, and, and minerals and, and, and such, that will deal with diabetes as well. Golden seal, juniper, and dandelion are mentioned here, um, but we know that uh, slippery elm, turkey rhubarb, burdock, uh, sheep sorrel, this is a, a four herb combination that's been known or noted for having really good results with diabetes. Um, we know that the mineral chromium is essential for diabetics uh, and so many you know, eating uh, habits that one can implement. And the main one I would suggest um, if, if I were fighting diabetes is to use very religiously the glycemic index because that tells you how starchy a food is. Okay, uh, so let's skip down a little bit and then I'm gonna check. I see there's a couple of messages. Headaches is a big one. You know, pain is a very, very big issue and there's so many different types of pain. When I used to do, you know, sort of healing clinics in different parts of, of Ghana, um, the one thing, and of course we know there was a, a language barrier and I'm terrible with languages. And I think you people who can speak, oh, you people, that doesn't sound right. I think people who can speak, <laughs> you know, your native language or multiple native languages and English and French and all these other things are just so phenomenal and so smart. And with all my years of traveling, I have not mastered any other language. Uh, to my dismay. And even as Queen Mother, you know, definitely there are people in my village that are like, she can't speak Fanti. You still haven't learned how to speak Fanti. No, I, I haven't. Sorry, you know. <laughs> but uh, so even though there is language barrier, the one thing that people would and could always say is pain. I'm having a pain. This is paining me. This is paining me. I have pain here or there. Uh, so pain is a big issue, but knowing what type of pain and where the pain is, that is important. So, uh, and again, we're going to get to a handout about pain in particular and the different types of pain. But here, when we're talking about headaches, there are several herbs that are really great for headache. Um, fever few is great especially for migraine headaches, you know, headaches that are in one side or part of the head. Um, but a lot of these sedative types of herbs or nervine herbs like hops, skullcap, uh, lemon balm, um, valerian, these are also good for headaches because they kind of help to relax the body, relieve aches and pains. Um, but then other, you know, very well-known antispasmodic, um, or pain relieving herbs like uh, 
white willow bark and metal sweet. I mentioned both of them earlier. These can also be really good for headaches as well. And along those lines, let me skip down. So yes, we know that there are also uh, menstrual pain uh, in uh, childbearing women who are still having a cycle. We know that there's pain associated with that. We know that there are PMS symptoms. So these herbs are great for that. Things like black cohosh and blue cohosh. These are known really as antispasmatics. They're really great if you're having like uh, muscle spasms or cramping, which could be from menstruation, but also even if you're having like back pain, which can be a, a PMS symptom, or it could be something that, you know, is happening for other reasons, um, depending on your physical, structural, uh, or skeletal condition, but they're really good for back pain specifically. Um, for other PMS symptoms, dandelion, donkwa, aspirilla, damiana, there are several others that will help uh, relieve those types of pains. Um, and I wanted to, oh, so I guess I did not add the other. Uh, maybe that is the only other. Well, I, I mentioned back pain. I mentioned arthritis pain. So, okay, I just wanted to make sure that I kind of hit on the uh, different types of pain. Um, but let me move on from that and just check really quickly your comments. Uh, pain in the liver. That's an interesting question. The liver is very resilient. Um, huh, and if there's a pain in the liver, uh, I would wonder if it's more so the gallbladder and if there are gallstones or, you know, if of course the liver can definitely be overworked. Um, so if it is the liver, then I would say doing your liver cleansing herbs. Um, when we talk in week four, we'll talk about how to flush and cleanse or detox the liver. But liver herbs are things like uh, yellow dock, burdock, milk thistle, golden steel. Uh, these are all really good for the liver. We know that foods uh, for the liver are things like beet, um, turmeric, um, there are a couple of recipes that we'll discuss for like juicing and smoothing and things like that um, when we get to week four. So if it is the liver, but you may want to address or, or consider other issues like the gallbladder, making sure you're not eating really oily uh, or fatty foods that can perhaps uh, wreak havoc on the gallbladder. If you are uh, drinking, if one is drinking in excess that can affect the liver, um, a lot of uh, prescription uh, or pharmaceutical medications can overwork the liver. Uh, so there are a lot of like environmental toxins and things that can impact the liver. Translate, let's see, yeah, I just said, me translating anything is a challenge and, and language is definitely not my forte. Um, and I, I understand that not everyone speaks English and this is not your first language. And in terms of translating, the best I can say, and the reason even some of the local herbs, and I often talk about finding your local herbalist, whether it's a Sangoma or whether it's a, a, a Nakonfo or a Ilarisha or someone who specializes in traditional local medicines or your local herbal clinic that, that exists in a lot of areas, that's gonna be your best bet if you need to translate or have something that one, you can readily understand and have written out for you or accessing things that you may not be able to access that's highlighted here. So I understand there's some barriers you know, with that. Um, aloe, vera is really aloe vera is really good for the colon and the, the gastrointestinal system not specifically the kidneys and liver, um, but as it is also um, good for the colon, which is a path of elimination, so are the kidneys and liver, so it wouldn't hurt, but it has most impact with the gastrointestinal system. So it's mild and, and good for aiding in digestion, elimination, and all of that when you're talking about using it internally. Um, let me scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Yeah, not that I am aware of long-term use of aloe vera. It, it is really mild. Um, that wouldn't be one of the ones from my knowledge and, and experience that will cause 
liver complications. We're more so talking about chemical or pharmaceutical or man-made synthetic types of uh, long-term use of things that will impact the liver. Uh, yeah, and if you can incorporate herbs into your diet like that and then adding them to meals, that's excellent. That's excellent, Zoe or Zoe. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so just trying to make sure I can address some of the questions because I did ask you to say if you had any particular concerns. Okay, so thank you for the welcome. So let's move to the next um, section. So this handout here, I included just to give you an idea of what is an excellent place to start in terms of having or developing your own natural medicine chest. And again, if these are, and, and I know for a fact, some of these you can access, but for others, if you're able to get them online, great. If not the equivalent, you know, you can seek out um, uh, locally in terms of whatever the local medicine uh, for these types of things are. So I always have on hand ginger whether it's in capsule, whether it's the actual root, um, whether it's the oil. Ginger is excellent for relieving pain. And I think I, I failed to mention ginger when we talked about arthritis pain and inflammation. Ginger is an excellent anti-inflammatory as well. But we also know that ginger has traditionally been used to lower fever. So um, when we mentioned earlier about colds and flu, ginger is definitely a good thing to add, whether you're taking it internally, whether you're doing a compress or rubbing yourself down with the topically with the essential oil of ginger, or whether you're using the ginger in a bath, which can help draw out aches and pains and things of that nature. For those reasons, ginger is great to have on hand. And of course, we know that internally ginger is also good for nausea, upset stomach. So ginger is something that I feel is a must have. White willow bark, I've mentioned it. This is excellent for pain and in pretty much any type of pain, white willow bark. And usually having it in capsules uh, is going to be best. You would probably have to drink to, you know, too much of the tea um, to really have an impact. But getting the white willow bark in capsule form, this is excellent. Valerian for the same reason. And this is a little milder to where traditionally it's been used for children, pregnant women, uh, seniors, um, because it's very effective, but very mild and not considered uh, like a stimulant to where it's an aggressive herb. Um, the next set, I put these together. I briefly mentioned these earlier as well. I think when I talked about skull cap and uh, lemon balm and hops, these are what we call sedative or um, nervine herbs. So these are great to have on hand if you're just having a stressful day, if you are um, not uh, being able to sleep easily, having a bit of insomnia, uh, or if you're just feeling stressed, you, you're like, oh, I couldn't wait to get home, it's been a really stressful day, or uh, it's just been a busy day, maybe if it's not registering as stressful. This just may be the type of tea you would sit down and have to drink, uh, you know, you after dinner tea, just to kind of help calm you down, settle you from a busy, uh, difficult day. Rescue remedy and multi-flower remedies. These we will talk a little bit more in detail about in week three next week when we talk about stress release. These are flower remedies. So similar to herbs, they do come from natural plants, but they are the flowering parts of trees and shrubs specifically. So whereas other herbs that we've mentioned thus far have been from herbal plants or your regular plants, these come from actual trees and shrubs. So more sturdy plant, a more robust, taller uh, plant like the tree. These specifically are formulated naturally to balance the emotions. So I always have rescue remedy or the multi-flower, one of each of the flower remedies combined for any kind of trauma. If someone is sick and they of course are experiencing some uh, anxiety around that, or you got bad news, someone passed, some, you know, someone was in an accident, uh, someone was ill, 
um, you got bad news or you're going through a divorce or, you know, you had a fight with a loved one, anything that kind of creates a traumatic emotional uh, response. These are the types of remedies that are good to have on hand for that. Uh, peppermint in tea or oil form. We know that peppermint is great for uh, settling the stomach, aiding in digestion. It kind of helps decrease the time that food is in the stomach. So it's a good after dinner tea as well. And again, we don't really drink a lot with our meals. We'll talk, did we talk about that already? I think that's week one. But what we, or maybe that's week four. Either way, if we have talked about it already, you'll get reinforcement. And if we've not talked about it, you'll hear it more later in detail. But we know we don't drink a lot with food. We limit our liquid uh, while we're eating to four ounces. So if you're going to have a cup of tea with your food, fine. Um, but also an hour or so after you've eaten your meal, this is an excellent after dinner tea. Um, because it will help aid in the digestion of your food. But we also know that peppermint is good to be used in uh, diffusers, like just the aroma of it itself can be healing for someone who has any kind of respiratory issues, or if it has calming value to you as it does me, peppermint is something I use daily. Um, so you can have it available in tea or oil form. Activated charcoal is basically a substance that absorbs toxins and allows for its removal from the body. So if you have eaten something that doesn't agree with you, so it doesn't have to be specifically food poisoning. It can just be something that upsets your stomach. You know, after you eat it, you're like, I don't think that, you know, suits me very well. I, I think this is causing, you know, some stomach upset or it could be from, uh, because you're having some diarrhea, but gastrointestinal issues, activated charcoal, can be a big relief. I do not travel without it. Um, so always I will get, you know, about of traveler's diarrhea um, just from the adjustment to the different types of foods, which I'm still very careful about in terms of what I'll eat, just because I do a lot of moving around when I do travel um, internationally. But it's something that I have on hand that can kind of quickly absorb the toxins help remove it and so that I can carry on and do what I'm there to do. Uh, aloe vera, so it was a couple of questions about aloe vera. It is something I recommend having on hand. I do suggest keeping this in your natural medicine chest. Um, and if you take it every day, especially if you're only taking a couple of ounces, which is generally what's used. So even people who are using it to kind of keep their, um, intestines clean and acting as that mild laxative, you really only need a couple of ounces of it a day anyway. Um, and again, be careful, we're not talking about these aloe vera drinks that you now will find in a lot of like Asian stores. And we know that Asians are <laughs> very prevalent now in Africa. Uh, so I'm sure there are a lot of Asian stores um, and you'll come across these aloe vera drinks. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about actual 100% pure aloe juice that does have healing and medicinal uh, powers, not the drink. Uh, colloidal silver, I mentioned, there are several handouts about colloidal silver. This boosts your immune system. This fights off infections of all kinds. This is something to really keep your system up if you have uh, constant contact with environmental toxins um, or if you're just around a lot of people, you're susceptible to their germs and microbes. You want to protect yourself and boost your immunity. Colloidal silver is definitely something to have on hand. And emergency packets, this is basically just an electrolyte drink. Now, the last time that I was in Ghana, I, I took a group of um, people with me, including my daughters. And my younger daughter um, had some stomach upset. And I remember the chief that was traveling with us, he kept re referencing something, but of course, in the local term. And he kept saying, Oh, you want me to go get her? Oh, and I wish I knew the name of it. But it ended up being, the, this little electrolyte packet, which the brand name or the company that's used here in the States is Emergency. 
Um, it's a little packet. Usually it's an orange or citrus kind of flavor. You add it to the water, but it kind of has like this, um, what do you call it? The fizzing kind of effervescent type of uh, action to it, but it's good for giving you, you know, your minerals and your vitamin C and such, but it can also kind of help um, push things out. So if you drink a packet or two, it'll kind of have that cleansing effect, right? Um, so I know that there are other names for some of these things. Um, but so when he went to the, you know, the pharmacy to get this and he comes with this little packet, I'm like, oh, okay, I know what this is. Um, but these are good to have on hand if you've lost a lot of fluids, like from vomiting or from diarrhea, or if you've been out and you've overexerted yourself from say sweating a lot or say you've worked out. This is what here in the United States, a lot of people drink Gatorade for, to get your trace minerals or your electrolytes replaced from having exerted a lot of uh, energy and lost a lot of fluids or water from the body. Um, so it's good to have on hand for several reasons. And because it is vitamin C, it does help boost your immune system as well. And this particular brand is only, is only um, what do you call it, sweetened with fructose, which is fruit sugars. So there's no other sugars or artificial sugars in it and, and that type of thing, as you would find in, say, a Gatorade drink. Uh, and then the last thing on this list is uh, having on hand a homeopathic remedy uh, kit. Um, you can usually buy um, a kit that has a, a multitude of remedies for different conditions. And so usually whatever issue you may have, you'll have it on hand. And I hope that homeopathics is next. I'm gonna skip over this. We've talked enough about herbs. Um, most we've already talked about, as you'll see as I'm scrolling by. Um, but let's talk a little bit about homeopathics. Homeopathy is another form of natural remedies, uh, but they can not only come from herbs or plants, but they may come from minerals, or some may even come from certain insects or animals. So for some people who are only looking for uh, herbal or plant-based remedies, of course, homeopathy may not be for you, uh, but those that still want natural occurring substances to treat conditions, homeopathy still may be uh, an option for you. And again, I, I'm gonna scroll through all of these herbal um, <laughs> handouts. As an herbalist, I find it difficult to do so, but I'm going to, I'm going to breathe <laughs> and be confident that I can pass up talking about herbs any longer. I, we're gonna move on to some other things. Look at all these wonderful herbal handouts. Use this later for your own information, right? This one talks about herbs or spices that we might call them because these are our culinary herbs or our kitchen herbs, right? And we'll talk about, I mean, they, they talk about, we're not gonna talk about, they talk about different ways in which uh, to use herbs to heal the body. Oh yes, I forgot that I added so much information about herbs. So again, <laughs> forgive me as I scroll through. So I did have these handouts here that, and we've talked about some of these. So we've talked about ginger. I think I've even mentioned some in the South African um, region like Buchu. So I mentioned some of these herbs, but I was able to find some handouts that did give information, um, printable information from some African herbs. Um, these just highlighted a few uh, from Western um, Africa. The other were from South Africa. But some of these we've still already mentioned. We didn't mention neem, um, but you'll have this information. Buchu we've mentioned, I think African potato, devil's claw. Devil's claw is great for pain. I'll, I will say that as I'm scrolling through, but I'm not gonna stop and talk about these. African potato is excellent for uh, immune system and all of that. We mentioned turmeric. I talked about it as an anti-inflammatory. I talked about it as good for the liver. This handout is actually out of place. I'll have to rescan this later because I put it smack dab in the middle of the African handout section. Um, but you'll be able to follow it. You'll just scroll through it. You'll say, oh, wait, this picks back up to the African herbs, right? African ginger, we've talked about that. And I also mentioned, and I know we um, list and, and talk about um, 
China as our time frame. So I'm assuming we have maybe some ambassadors there. So I included some of the Chinese herbs, but again, I'm not going to stop and discuss those. Use this for your own toolbox so that you will have plenty of information on herbs. I even included some herbs from India. Now, this uh, type of natural healing is called Ayurveda. Uh, so this talks about some of the common herbs in India. Some we've heard and are commonly used here. Some, you know, you may normally just find there. Neem is a common one because we know that it was through colonialism, it migrated into different parts of Africa. Uh, we talked about turmeric. Okay, so I did promise to talk about painkillers. So I will talk again about herbs briefly. So painkillers, pain is a big issue. These are some of the highlights of how to use these different herbs for pain. So we know garlic we've mentioned already, but we know that we can make a oil for the ear aches and ear infections and things with garlic. Usually uh, a vegetable based oil like olive oil or almond oil or safflower oil or coconut oil. Or something. Eh, coconut might solidify that that might not work well, um, but maybe something like olive oil and garlic and you know you add it into now one of the traditional old school remedies where I'm from here. Uh, we used to use sweet almond oil. That still works. You can even use garlic in the almond oil. But we also know that cloves, which we often will cook with and use as a spice, is good for toothaches and gum inflammation. We know that apple cider vinegar, which is not necessarily a herb, these are just kind of natural pain relievers, period. Not all are herbs, uh, but this is good for heartburn and digestion. People use it to lose weight. So many issues um, can be addressed uh, positively with apple cider vinegar. We've talked about ginger is good for muscle pain and so many other things we've already mentioned. We know that cherries is good for joint pain and inflammation, um, especially gout or different types of uh, arthritis. Uh, it's also good for headaches. We know that turmeric is good for pain and inflammation. Peppermint is good for sore muscles, and this can be internally and topically. Eucalyptus, I would probably match with this, which is not listed here, but if we're talking about sore muscles, eucalyptus would be great for that as well. We also know that pineapple is good for uh, gastrointestinal pain, um, stomach aches, bloating, gas. Pineapple is good for because of the bromelain inside of pineapple that helps with digestion. So if you're having some kind of indigestion, it gives that natural enzyme to break down the food. And so here I would have to mention paw pain, which comes from the papaya, which I know these are readily found in different parts of Africa, right? Uh, and so papaya is also good for stomach pain, bloating, and gas. Um, then we know heart horseradish is good for sinus pain. It opens up the sinuses, the nasal passages, and all of that. And then we know blueberries are great for bladder and urinary tract infections. But then I would also mention cranberries here as for the same exact thing. It's also good for urinary uh, tract infections and for the bladder. And then of course, water. We, we know that's not an herb, but in terms of a natural remedy or natural cure for pain, water is excellent. If you are dehydrated, you will most likely stiffen up. You will most likely um, feel pain. Water is cleansing and flushing and healing. So it can help assist in the general recovery of pain, okay? And give relief on many levels. Now, I know we're going to get to these homeopaths. This is just enough. This is very similar. Uh, but when I was going through little handouts of different things, this pretty much talks about the same ones that were listed in on the other one. And then this just gives you sort of some safety guidelines about herbs, how to take it, when to take it, some of the doses. The, the, the main thing I put this handout in here for is for the dosing. So here, I think it's at the end, it gives you an idea of how, if you see here, how to administer herbs to children. Most of the instructions you will find, say on bottles or even in, in lectures or in talking, which I don't generally give dosing, right? Because I'm not here for that. Um, I'm just telling you what these herbs traditionally are used for. But if you decide to use herbs uh, 
for any issue or concern that you have. This just gives you an idea of how to administer it for children of different ages. So that's just sort of for your own use and for your information. And now we are with the homeopathics, right? So homeopathy is what pharmacology is based off of. However, homeopathy or homeopathic medicine only uses naturally derived substances. But as I previously mentioned, this could be plant-based, but it also is largely mineral-based. And I liked this handout, even though there are hundreds, um, there are hundreds of, um, I always look over on my bookshelf thinking that I have some of the books that I have over at my office. One day I'm gonna bring them over here, but it's just too many. But there is a book that will list all of the homeopathic remedies. So there are many. This handout just highlights 10. And I like this handout because it tells you the source. So several of the ones that are listed here are food-based or plant-based. So allium sepa, for example, comes from the onion. Um, magnesium phosphorus comes from uh, magnesium, a mineral. So it'll give you indication of where the source of the remedy comes from. But basically, homeopathic remedies are used um, in the right dosing uh, or dosaging uh, to treat a condition that in a certain situation would cause that problem. So the best example here is this allium sepa. It comes from an onion. We know that naturally an onion will make you tear up, get your eyes watery, maybe even your nose running. Well, as the remedy allium, this will treat those same types of symptoms. But usually, of course, like when you're having a cold or flu or something of that nature, this remedy is good for cold, hay fever symptoms like watery, runny eyes, uh, burning, watery discharge from the nostrils, uh, things of that nature, right? So this is just one prime example of how the concept of like cures like. The other important note about homeopathic remedies is that it's taken away from food on what we call a clean mouth, meaning you've not just brushed your teeth, you've not just eaten food. You've not drank anything other than water. You want to separate at least 30 minutes to an hour from doing those things. So ideally an hour at least, right? And you really don't want to use a strong aromatic type of toothpaste like peppermint, which most toothpaste are, because uh, peppermint is so wonderful, right? But if you're taking homeopathy uh, remedies, then you want to do what's called a homeopathic toothpaste or a no mint toothpaste, just because that strong aroma of the peppermint just kind of deals, uh, I won't say weaken, but it just, yeah, it kind of weakens the effectiveness of the homeopathic remedy. But it's taken in the mouth, which is why you need a clean mouth, and you're taking it under the tongue, so that's called sublingually. So you're taking the remedy, which is usually in pellets or tablets, sometimes in liquid extract, but you're taking it under the tongue and allowing it to dissolve and then absorb into the body through the mucous membranes in your mouth. So it goes more directly and more quickly into your bloodstream rather than swallowing a capsule or swallowing herbal tea um, and it having to go through the digestive system, okay? So that's how homeopathic works, how homeopathic remedies work. So some of the other remedies, Arnica, this is one that's used uh, if you feel like you've injured yourself. Uh, so topically, if you have injured yourself, um, it speeds the uh, healing process. So if you've overexerted yourself while running or working out or something like that, right? There are different gels and ointments and creams that you can use on it. Um, it's also good from the for just the shock and fear of uh, injury or the trauma, I should say, not fear, the trauma of injuring yourself. And again, doesn't have to be in sports uh, uh, activities. It could be you stumped your toe or you ran into a door or you fell, you know, on the crack in the sidewalk or what have you. But this kind of helps aid the healing process, Arnica. This is also plant-based. It comes from the mountain daisy. Chamomilla is another homeopathic remedy. This comes from the herb chamomile. 
um, but made into a homeopathic remedy. This is excellent for irritable infants, those who are teething or have colic, uh, but also can just be good for adults. If you need calming down, if you are hysterical or having some sort of irritability, chamomilla is excellent for that. Hypericum is also a plant-based um, homeopathic remedy. This comes from St. John's wort. And this injury, this is for injuries um, like nerve pain, things like that. However, it's also good, hypericum is good uh, just as St. John's wort is with depression and it also is like an anti, has antiviral properties as well, right? Um, Ignatia, this plant-based comes from the St. Ignatius bean. Uh, this is good for psychiatric disorders. Um, so acute grief, anxiety, depression, this is a remedy that you would use for that. I mentioned earlier, magnesia, uh, phosphorica. This comes from the mineral, it's a mineral base. This comes from the phosphate of magnesium. Uh, and so this is good for cramps, um, especially menstrual cramps, but any kind of cramps. Um, and this is good, um, if you know the the pain or the discomfort of the cramps kind of makes you a little imbalanced or, or what have you, this can also kind of help with uh, that. Which is you know some of these remedies you can tell who wrote the explanations because they make oh no. Um, yes, as we are waiting for Nana Akur uh, to join again. You can just write, uh, if you have uh, a question, you can write it in the comment section. Uh, yes, uh, Yvonne, I can see um, Nana Kua had the uh, network issues, but uh, she's uh, joining uh, soon. So for those who wanted some handouts who are not in our WhatsApp groups, we shared an action group link, join that group. And also I did share nanakua1 at gmail.com for handouts. You can reach out to her, ask for handouts. Um, she, she will email you back. Uh, yes, I should reach out to her to, uh, through her email address I did share with you. So Natikumalo, uh, you can reach out to her. Your sister with the handouts if you're not in our groups. Mm -hmm. So, for those uh, who want to join our WhatsApp group, I'm going to share again a link so that you can join the group. And also, we do have a wait list for the next Pan African class lectures. You are all advised to, to join if you are not in any of our WhatsApp groups. You can join that group. Yeah, so we are not letting anyone who is using uh, their, their username with phone numbers, is uh, phone names, I mean, because uh, some people were doing um, things which were inappropriate. So Nana Kua is big. <laughs> so I, was, I was probably one of the ones you wasn't letting in. So I got on my phone, uh, So and I understand. That I'm gonna get a new laptop soon. Oh, I, and, and it just goes out. But it's just the battery. So, you know, I'm not that technically savvy. And it's not one of those batteries I can easily take out and buy, which I would easily do. Somebody gonna help me with that one, Dad, and just put it out there. Uh, walk me through it or something. But I gotta unscrew something to replace this battery on this laptop. But I was trying to get on the phone. So, um, that was me. Uh, award trying to get in through my phone. Anyway, right. my apologies. Yeah, but um, so let's go back. Hopefully, it is still. Uh, so we were talking about um the homeopathic remedy. So yes, so magnesium mainly used for menstrual cramps, 
um, you know, sort of that pain associated with, you know, really needing to bend over for relief. And I was talking about how some of the um, remedies, and I'm going to skip down to this, oh, what's it that? Uh, it was one that talked about, oh, maybe it's not in this hand now. Um, okay, well, let me, let me just go on then. Um, Nux Vomica is another remedy, also from uh, plant-based. This is mainly used for um, needing relief from overeating or over drinking and you need to purge. Um, so it allows the body to kind of purge and cleanse itself from whatever toxins or over intoxication that you have, um, you know, put into your system. Um, so that's really good for that. And even if you take it and you say you don't need to throw up, then you won't. But if that is what will bring you relief and, and purge your body from whatever um, overuse of substances, then that is what will happen. And so these um, remedies, you know, God is amazing. And so all of these things kind of do what your body needs them to do. And that's just how herbs and homeopathics work. An herb or a homeopathic may do 20 things. But of course, if that's not what you need or your body needs, then that's not what will occur. Um, pulsatilla is the next one. This comes from windflower. Uh, so this one is excellent for, again, psychological, well, physical and psychological symptoms. So it's good. And, and most, if you read the um, homeopathic um, uh, manual, it will have different characteristics about any condition and what these different remedies do. So this one's kind of getting into that. So it's telling you physically what is happening, psychologically what is happening. Uh, but this, oh, this is the one I was looking for. It says it's generally given to women and children um, and it gives these different characteristics. Um, but again, a lot of things can be used for male and females, but again, it's giving you traditionally what it's used for. So if you need, uh, if this is a person who's kind of gentle and um, a yielding kind of person or meek kind of person, and maybe they need to be a little more assertive, this is good for that. Um, Rust toxins, poison ivy, that is based from poison ivy. So we know what this will treat. So this will treat poison ivy, but also other conditions like sprains and strains. But also if you come in contact with poison ivy, they make rust tox soap, they make rust tox um, creams to soothe the itching of that. But then it also has other um, uh, qualities or other symptoms that it will treat. So that's just sort of an overview on homeopathic remedies. And then this handout gives you natural first aid with homeopathic remedies. So if you are someplace and you've burned yourself, there is a homeopathic remedy called arsenicum that is excellent for that. If you've had an eye injury, um, aconite is good for that. So there are all sorts of remedies depending on what issue you have. I think heat stroke is an excellent one if you're in a hotter climate to know what can address heat stroke as I've often experienced also in my travels. Belladonna is excellent for that. Deals with head pain resort, resorting from overheating. Uh, Brionia is good um, for that because if you get, again, splitting headaches, usually brought on by overexposure to heat. Um, these are excellent things to have on hand uh, for that as well. Uh, insect bites, apis, uh, ledum, if you've uh, scraped yourself or caused some kind of puncture wound, there are uh, remedies for that. So this is just, again, for your information to have on hand. So now, quickly, let's go into homeopathic <laughs> remedies. I don't know if y'all can hear my cat, but she is just really being loud. Um, she talks too, so I think she wants to teach the class as well, <laughs> as she got louder. Um, so essential oils are basically parts, again, are flowering parts of, um, oh goodness, what did I do? Um, flowering parts of plants that are uh, diluted or uh, extracted from the parts of the plant. 
that was not an invitation to come in. And so there are many different essential oils that are used for a number of different things. So you may use them uh, through a diffuser, you may use them in massage, in baths, in different uses. Usually the rule of thumb with that is you're gonna dilute it. If you're using it topically on your body, you're gonna put it in what's called a carrier oil because the essential oils are very potent, very strong. So a lot of times you do not want to place them directly on your skin, especially your face or another sensitive area. Um, and these are just basically some of the uses um, and even herbs, I mean, uh, oils that you can combine these different oils with. So this also is for your information. We've mentioned some of these herbs um, in other forms, but know that there are essential oils that you can use. You can use them in baths, as a compress, as a mouthwash, a number of different things, okay? So I think we're running out of time, so I won't have time to go over that. But there is another handout here that just sort of gives an abbreviated um, explanation very quickly of what to use them for. So if you're looking to be more alert, you may do some of the citrus types of oils. If you're looking for digestion, you would do the ginger and peppermint. If you're looking for memory, rosemary, basil, lemon, these are ones that you would use for that and so on and so forth. Um, so that handout I came across and thought was very helpful. And then lastly, superfoods. These are foods that basically are highly um, nutrient dense foods, highly nutritive foods that you should likely add to your diet. Uh, it gives an explanation of how this list was comprised, but basically if you want to operate on an optimal level, if you want to increase your energy, if you want to decrease your stress, it all starts with what you're putting in your body and choosing or making the best selection of foods is the way to go. So what made this list, and this is from Dr. X, um, who's a, a, a notable um, doctor here in the, in the States, um, came up with this list. Almonds, broccoli rabi, uh, avocados, raw milk, wheat grass, salmon, flax seeds, blueberries, cinnamon, and sweet potatoes. These are actual foods. And, and basically, again, they have a lot of, so not just, oh, you might, sometimes the most people can say about a banana, for example, is it's rich in potassium. Um, and not that that's all that's in bananas, but these foods for sure, you can list multiple nutrients that you will find in them. And then you also have a list of like seeds and nuts and other foods that generally people are adding to their um, smoothies and cereals and things of that nature. So while they're still foods, this it was on a separate list that I found that I thought was worthy of mentioning. So you have acai berries, um, blueberries. Oh, wait, I, I thought I skipped over it, but I didn't. Okay, so you have acai berries, you have goji berries, you have um, seaweed, um, chia seeds. All of these generally you wouldn't eat necessarily by themselves, but you can. But most people are now adding them to your smoothies and things of that nature, mango steam, or you may just take them in supplement form uh, differently. Maca powder, um, uh, cacao or cocoa powder, um, and those sort. Oh, and I did put colloidal silver here. So yes, colloidal silver, since I'm almost out of time. So this is the last thing. So this just gives that handout. Um, I mentioned the handout that I sent in the WhatsApp group, but this is just an overview of colloidal silver. It's a natural antibiotic. This is what was used before penicillin and amoxicillin and all of that came about. And so I highly suggest you look into to that and seeing what use you can find from colloidal silver in terms of boosting your immune system. Um, so looking through quickly to see, and yes, as always, and if award, maybe you can put my email because if there's anyone that's not in the WhatsApp group that needs, and I see a couple of people have put their email. If you're looking for uh, the handouts, please email me and request the handouts and I'll happily send those to you. So, all right, so I am out of time. Pardon the battery mishap with the computer and losing connection for a couple of minutes, but thanks for joining me today and I'll see you next week. And as always, I bid you good health and peace.
Right, thank you so much, uh, Nana Kua, for a wonderful lecture. We really enjoyed it. I did include your email address in the chat section for those who need uh, handouts. I think you, we appreciate you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. All right. Yes, uh, on next, I'm uh, going to have um, Professor um, uh, Tyreen Wright. Yes, sir, Dr. Wright, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. And I guess in a second, I can, you'll see me. Hold on, let me get my light right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Pedagogy History and Ideological Development and Training course. Let me get my lighting right. Okay, so welcome, everyone. It's so funny because I was so happy to hear that. Uh, Nana Okua has a cat like me because when I'm teaching, they go crazy. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to hear that, that I'm not the only one with the cat who's like, yes, I want to teach too. So one second, you'll see me this week. So this past week, you've read uh, chapter uh, two of the book T. Washington and Africa book. Uh, it's so funny because this book has had a, a rebirth, as many things do go through a cycle and they go and then they come back. And um, I want you guys to see me, so hold on. Uh, they go and then they come back again. So that's what's happening with this book. Uh, I've been, uh, because the new version of it is coming out. Um, so... That being said, I will go over what you should have uh, read, and then I will be posting the new materials. And um, let's see if you can see me. All right, good, you can see me. Okay, so I'll be posting the new materials and um, everything you need for this week of our course and um, all the relevant information as it relates to that. So um, yeah, so that's what's happening today. So once again, welcome everyone. I want you guys to see, so what I'm gonna be adding after this week, um, we'll be done with the Booker T. Washington in Africa book because you read chapter two of this. This week, you're going to be reading chapter um, five and six, I think it is, um, the chapter on the Liberian crisis, and then the chapter on the African exclusion measure, which I might have mentioned already, um, which is a case, these are the two concrete policy cases that give you an example of Pan-Africanism. Um, so I'll be sharing those in the group as we speak, as I'm teaching. And then uh, the other readings that we're gonna do that are related to um, others, um, so we can talk about the highest expression of Pan-Africanism as it manifests on the African continent. I'll be uh, using Nkrumah, uh, Du Bois, Garvey, uh, some writings from, um, where is it? Oh, well, I'll, I'll dip down and get it. I'll be using a lot of, hold on, let me add this. So I'll be using a lot of um, a mill called Cabral, who I love from Return, Return to the Source. Um, so I'll be using a lot of his readings, some of his essays. This is a co collection of essays. Um, and, and we will get to some of this issue as it relates to African people and like Eastern Europeans and that context, because I think a lot of you, because of the whole war in Ukraine and this and that and the other, um, are probably a little more curious now than you've been in the recent past about, um, prior to this, about um, African and Eastern Bloc relations. And so, um, Cabral is the, holds the position that we want to have on some of those things um, when, it talk, when, when it relates to African people, and particularly our Pan-Africanists have engaged in um, 
I'm dealing with Marxism and Leninism and everything like that. And there is a particular line and idea and position that we need to have as African people when we navigate those um, ideologies and those um, theories about revolution and uh, social change and stuff like that. So um, I do add, you know, a couple of um, tech, a couple of um, essays from Return to the Source. But also I've been last cycle, I always try to make sure that I'm keeping up with my reading. I read this and I'll be adding some of this. This is a history of Pan-African revolt by CLR James. So I'm gonna be scanning a couple of chapters from this that you'll be reading um, that gives you some idea about our Pan-African struggle world rot, world rot, worldwide. <laughs> world rot. That was like a tongue twister. Uh, worldwide, okay? So I will be um, dealing with some of that from this book. There's a whole chapter on our six his, uh, section on a history of Pan-African revolt, okay? And it just gives you some perspective about the African world, how we are simultaneously without conference, without uh, sitting down with each other, um, having uh, very similar experiences and how we are all without, I said, conference to a large extent, um, we are all struggling for our right to live free and full lives in the world as African people. And so, um, you know, this book really brings that home because it gives you a lot of information about various um, realities throughout the African world and how we are engaging in that struggle everywhere we are. So it's the epitome of a Pan-Africanist text. Um, that chronicles our, our, our struggles. The other thing is, is that I'm going to probably include something in here or another in a book I just got. And this is one of the things that I'm reading myself. And so I'm going to read real fast so that I can decide and determine what I want to use for this class. Um, because I got a book that a lot of people don't really know about. <laughs> Sorry, that was my cat. Uh, uh, a lot of people don't really know about, uh, which is uh, this, When Africa Awakes. Oh, and by the way, this is CLR James, the great CLR James, for those of you who don't know, okay? So if you ever want to know what the teacher is reading, you know, what the professor is reading, or, you know, that, that should help you. Right. Um, so this is what I'm reading right now. When Africa Awakes by Hubert Harrison, Hubert Henry Harrison. And he really um, he, he attempts to break down the struggles of the Pan-African world. So it says the collection originally published in 1920 provides valuable insight on the Pan-African world of Harrison's time and sheds considerable light on the state of the contemporary African world. Harrison used the term Africa to signify the unity of black people throughout the world. And I used um, the term Africa and African similarly, right? Um, because like Dr. John Henry Clark said, it's like Africa, African is who you are. Black is how you look, right? So anyway, um, that's just to kick off so that you guys know, just give me some perspective in terms of what I'm reading. And it's a constant, um, it's a constant endeavor. It's not ever like so you're ever done learning, right? It always, um, one of the things I should stress in this course is like, you all are committed to learning what we are um, teaching here for the purpose of working for I Love Black People, but um, that's how it is for us in general as human beings, right? Like we have to be committed to learning things that are going to be relevant to our lives and struggles in general, right? And so uh, we have a particular task before us as um, African people who are navigating a world dominated by white supremacy and culture, uh, so which is diametrically opposed to our well-being, our survival, our uh, ability to thrive and all of that. Um, let me just put this on 
uh, pause one. Well, no, I'm not going to pause. Let me just, um, I'll just go through it as we are. So last time we were together, you all were given this chapter, Booker T. Washington, Pan-Africanism and Pan-Africanist. And um, it opened the door to have some conversation about Garvey, Du Bois, and others. Uh, and it chronicled the Pan-African world. So you should have read this by now. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, so good. You should have read this by now. That being said, um, I'm just going to recap the important points, one of which is on page 16, where um, basically I highlight and do a roll call of the you know, Pan-Africanists who are contributing to this moment in time in history. So I'm just going to touch on these points that you should have already read during the course of the week and um, just to highlight them. So it says, prior to the first Pan-African Conference, 19th, or 19th and early 20th century Pan-Africanists in the US was espoused and practiced by individuals like Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. Matter of fact, hold on, let me, um, let me, let me uh, share my screen and uh, so people who don't have it can read along. Yeah, the cats want to teach the class too. No, I'm teaching. Uh, hold on one second. Let me scroll up to it. I should have had this queued for you guys, but if not, then I'll go on another source. Got a lot of dialogue in here. So I'm in one of the courses. So, okay, here we go. Okay, do I have permit? Hold on, let me just close all this other stuff. <laughs> okay. One moment, bear with me. Just trying to close a few things so that I can share my screen without selling all my business. <laughs> And I have too much open already. Okay, can I have uh, permission to share my screen? Yes, you're allowed. Okay, perfect. All righty. So there you guys should see my screen there. Um, so this is the chapter that I'm reading from and that you guys should have read this past week. We're gonna be moving on to, um, the two evidentiary chapters. And what that means is the evidence in the two cases that uh, conclusively uh, support the fact that Booker T. Washington was a Pan-Africanist, not uh, through ringing declaration, not an idea, but in a concrete, tangible, real life way and, and in the context of two policy cases, which means that he produced something that is measurable, right? So this is where I'm at. I'm gonna highlight, I'm just gonna highlight this and the relationship with Du Bois and Washington and the relationship with uh, Washington and Garvey. Uh, and so prior to the first Pan-African Conference, 19, 19th and early 20th century Pan-Africanism in the U.S. was espoused by and practiced by individuals like Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, Martin Delaney, Edward Blyden, Henry Highland Garnett, and Alexander Crummel. But as early as 1829, David Walker's appeal reflected on the history of the African civilizations and of African civilizations and made a connection between those of Africa and Africans scattered abroad. His appeal not only aimed to challenge the institution of slavery, but to educate the masses on African history and culture. Pan-Africanists amongst the African population in the Caribbean included the in initiator of the first Pan-African conference, Henry Sylvester Williams of Trinidad, 
Marcus Garvey's mentor, J. Robert Love, and Dr. J. Albert Thorne from Barbados. But decades prior to their emergence, the Haitian Revolution occurred and bolstered Pan-African consciousness in the diaspora as well. Haiti would produce Benito Sylvain and Antonin Furman, both whom met Booker T. Washington in 1897 and attended the first Pan-African Conference in 1900. Out of Haiti came a wing of Pan-Africanists who created literary discourse on diasporic African, diasporic philosophies on Africa. The African population in Haiti produced Jean Prince Mars and Louis Joseph, who repeatedly explained that Haiti was the embodiment of the irresistible force of a united Africa. Pan-Africanism had a dialectical characteristic to it which allowed historic events like the Haitian Revolution to produce a response and rise in consciousness amongst African people internationally. Similarly, in 1896, the Ethiopian victory over Italian imperialist forces in the Battle of Ottawa also bolstered the connection between diasporic Africans and those on the continent. I should have put Africa, right? Continent of Africa. The social climate and consciousness of the African diaspora in the Western Hemisphere and throughout the world produced two of the most prolific Pan-African myths, W.E.B. Dubois and Marcus Garvey. Each of these men had important relationships and exchanges with Booker T. Washington. Marcus Garvey's relationship with Washington would open the door both literally and figuratively to the first mass organization of the Pan-African world, uh, the universal Pan-African world. Uh, the, the, through the Universal Negro Improvement Association. However, Washington's relationship with Du Bois would be inconsequential to the progress of Pan-Africanism the relationship between Washington, the apparent accommodationist, and Du Bois, the Pan-Africanist scholar activist, has shaped African-American social and political history in the U.S. for at least a century. Booker T. Washington and, and Du Bois uh, and Marcus Garvey would all function differently as Pan-Africanists. The methods they employed varied, but like previous Pan-Africanists, they all had one singular objective beyond unity, which was to advance the plight of African people in the face of oppression, okay? So um, that's what you should have gotten from uh, that commentary in chapter uh, two. And then um, I summarize, I get into the relationship between Washington and Du Bois, and that's mostly for people who are, you know, in the Western Hemisphere, particularly in the United States, and, and, you know, want to know a little bit more about that relationship between the two men. I break down that relationship the first nine years of their interaction, which was um, a positive and productive relationship, okay? And then I talk about Marcus Garvey and um, Washington. Um, Washington was the reason that Marcus Garvey actually comes to the United States. And this is an image right here of the international, um, the 1912 International Conference on the Negro held at Tuskegee. And it was a conference where uh, the industries, the 44 industries that existed at Tuskegee uh, were opened up to the African and international world for people to study and take the best practices back to their locales. It's at this event, and that is an original image from the period. That is literally an image from the period coming from Tuskegee Ar archives. Um, but this at this conference, there would be eight educators. This international conference would be people from around the world and eight educators from the small African island nation of Jamaica would attend. And they would get a chance to explore Tuskegee's 44 industries, take back best practices, 
And part of this conference resolutions were to erect a Tuskegee-like institute and on the island of Jamaica, okay? And uh, that was part of the conference resolutions. These eight educators who would be there at this conference hear that that is part of the resolutions would go back to Jamaica and share all of this information with none other than Marcus Garvey. Okay, Marcus Garvey would um, be impressed by what he heard. He had already known of Booker T. Washington. He read Up From Slavery, Booker T. Washington's autobiography. He said that the text, the book inspired him and informed him of his doom to be a race leader. He then would learn more about Tuskegee through the eight educators who went to this very conference that you see the picture of here in Tuskegee. He learns from them in terms of what they bring back from this conference. They explain that there's 44 industries at this, what seems like school, uh, but is really a sustainable uh, African industrial community that masquerades at a, a school. And he um, has a desire to go see this Tuskegee for himself. In the meantime, he initiates contact with Booker T. Washington. And if you read the entire chapter, you see that there's some documented correspondence between Marcus Garvey and Booker T. Washington. He begins to write Washington in 1912, shortly after, end of, after the end of this conference. They talk about a number of things uh, that they both get attacked in the public realm by their own people, okay, notably. Uh, and then Marcus Garvey decides to design and establish the Universal Negro Improvement Association. He writes to Washington that he has initiated this organization and that he has modeled it after the Tuskegee model. This is where that concept of multiple industries comes from, um, from the Tuskegee model. Washington uh, you know, is happy to hear this and Garvey sends that note about the Universal Negro Improvement Association along with a pamphlet showing how he modeled and structured the Universal Negro Improvement Association after the Tuskegee model, okay? Uh, Garvey also becomes aware through the eight educators that attended about the conference resolution and the desire to create, erect a Tuskegee-like institute in Jamaica. And so he does begin to travel around the Caribbean to raise money. Um, when you see him writing about him and talking about him moving around to raise money for a school, the school was not um, simply a thought that he had. It is the school that is found in the conference resolutions at Tuskegee's International Conference on the Negro. Okay, So um, this is very important because it shows how we are sort of in they become in conversation with each other, right? But they also become, you know, we are in general throughout history, as you'll see as I go on, we are in conversation with each other all around the world, you know? And that's, that's an important um, point, right? So uh, this exhibits that, that we are on a continuum in terms of how we are communicating with each other over time and from continent, from country to country, right? Um, so I'm gonna leave it there with Garvey. Um, briefly, I'll talk about Du Bois in Washington. Du Bois in Washington, you know, they have a nine year relationship that prior to the break, um, if, if you read the material this past week, you saw I show, I include Du Bois' first correspondence with Washington uh, in 18, I believe, 94 and 18, yeah, 1894, when Du Bois is graduating from Harvard. 
with his PhD in history. And uh, they continue that relationship. That being said, they have a positive relationship for the first nine years. Um, unfortunately, that dissipates, but it's not for the reasons that many people will think, actually. I actually, I have it right here, but there's an essay that Du Bois writes later on in his life that discusses what happened between him and Booker T. Washington. And it was actually not the difference, the programmatic difference. The different, the, the problem between the two of them was is that a very old generational problem between senior man and junior man um, and, and a conflict that typically happens as people come of age and begin to challenge you know, the old guard, the old way of thinking. Um, and Washington has still had significant power. That was Du Bois's issue with him. He did not like that Washington had significant control of the black press because he could wield it in a way where he could silence Du Bois and others of his, um, uh, any of his other contemporaries or counterparts or cohorts, so to speak. So this older man had power that uh, Du Bois did not approve of and did not approve of how he used it. Then said later on, there's the case, the case I'm going to talk about today, two of the cases I'm going to talk about today. One of them is a case where Washington uses this um, soft power, the power of his influence over the black press and his power in the form of something called the Tuskegee machine, uh, a secret network of power brokers that he um, had command of and would uh, essentially instruct them on how to maneuver politically behind the scenes and undercover, so to speak. And that machine, this secret network, would be the difference between Du Bois, Washington, and any of the rest in the final case that we discussed today called the African Exclusion Measure. I'm just going to introduce the cases. You'll be reading them this week, but I find that, um, I think I said it last time, this is the best way to do it so that people know what they're walking into before you read. I sort of give you like a preview, right? So let me, um, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna, I want you guys to see me. I don't know how to do that. Okay, well, anyway, I'll figure it out. All right. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to stop the share <laughs> so that you can see me talking to you. Okay. So, yes, I got it. So, um, yeah. So, Washington and Du Bois actually have a positive relationship until the summer of 1903 when Souls of Black Folks comes out. And it's not they fall out because of Souls of Black Folks, they fall out because. Du Bois actually ends up, uh, how would you say, going to see Monroe Trotter and coalescing with him with regard to the riots in Boston. And Washington didn't like that because he had spent the whole summer at his house in Tuskegee. And Du Bois frequented Tuskegee, by the way, right? Uh, the only reason why I don't say in this book that Du Bois actually uh, taught at Tuskegee is because I never found a syllabus that could substantiate that. But he is there. It's very likely that he taught there on, on occasion during the summer at Tuskegee. And if you saw, you see the chapter that you have, you see that Du Bois writes Washington asking him for a job on more than one occasion. And he's seeking to do something similar to what he um, did in the would go on to do in the Philadelphia study of the Negro at um, Penn. Uh, he was looking to actually do that at Tuskegee as well, right? He talks about putting the study of the Negro on more scientific grounds. So the cats are going crazy today, right? Now, now, Kua's cat and now mine. <laughs> they are trying to take over, right? Um, anyway, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but it's right here in making noise. So 
so this whole thing with Washington Du Bois does relate to this case, one of the cases that we're going to talk about today, which is the African exclusion matter. I'm just going to introduce them. I'm not going to go through them. And that is for next week after you have read them. Okay. And then I will get into like a deep discussion. For now, I'll just give you a cursory understanding of them. The first case is called the Liberian Crisis. And you'll be reading that. Hold on, let me see. All right, I'm gonna take myself off the camera real quick. Plug this in. Uh, so the first case called the Liberian Crisis. I'm gonna be sharing in real time, okay? I'm back. <laughs> I'm gonna be sharing in real time the case and uh, you will be reading it this week. And the case basically details um, a situation in Liberia where the French, the British and the German colonial forces attempt to annex Liberia. And it's none other than uh, Booker T. Washington who stops the annexation of this territory by the French, the British, and the Germans really, but the French and the British are the main ones uh, vying for control of this particular territory. And so Washington is the person who is the key negotiator to stop this situation in, the, um, in Liberia, okay? Um, that's giving you the short version. It is a long protracted struggle that he proves himself to be a long-term and long um, enduring, and you know, how do you say, a long distance runner, somebody who has endurance in terms of negotiation because this case is about five years long. The, um, in the book, there's a picture that I always call the money shot. And that picture is of the Liberian crisis. Um, during the Liberian crisis, it is Liberian officials in the garden at Tuskegee. Some of the actual visual evidence of this case because Washington invites the former president and vice president president and some of the standing officials of Liberia to the U.S. hold secret meetings for them at the White House. So sometimes you can't believe what you hear in the public realm, like Booker T. Washington goes to the White House in 1905 for the first time. No, he frequented the U.S. White House um, under Roosevelt and then Taft, right, who he was both an advisor to. That being said, he is facilitating. You see him fight a, a fight um, to force the United States to support Liberia uh, and stop the French and the British from annexing the territory. Um, what else do I want to say about this case? It's very important because you also get a chance to see Booker T. Washington, who uh, people try to say did not believe in um, did not believe in voting, which is not true, but that's the propaganda in the public realm. Um, you see him leverage the black vote to force US officials to get involved in securing Liberia. So let me be more specific. There is a point in the case where you see him write to Taft to, uh, Roosevelt, whatever you do or fail to do in order to secure Liberia will be remembered by 4 million Negroes at voting time. And he has to use the term Negro. We don't use that term anymore, but that's what he says. So in other words, whatever you do or fail to do, Black people in this country will remember that and it will impact you when they go to the polls. That's not someone who does not believe in voting. That is someone who is leveraging the black vote against um, or using it as leverage 
against US politicians who have the power to intervene in Liberia on behalf of Liberia and against others, other imperialist nations on the continent of Africa that are trying to gain additional territory. Mind you, Liberia is the only, is only one of two, one of only two independent African nations on the continent of Africa at that time. All the other territories are already being colonized as a result of the 1880, 1884 Conference of Berlin, where they carve up Africa, the scramble for Africa, and or in their, in some European imperialist nation's sphere of influence, okay? If not a direct uh, territory that they're claiming or a colony that they're claiming. Okay, other areas are under the sphere of influence of various European nations. So that being said, that's what the Liberian crisis is about. And I'm going to open them up in here and um, you'll see them get posted. Then the other case is a much shorter case, which deals with what's called the African exclusion measure. It is the case where I talk about Washington using the Tuskegee machine. Basically, it is in 18, in 1914, the Panama Canal was completed and the United States um, had employed African and black laborers to build the Panama Canal. When the Panama Canal is completed, uh, the United States being the type of nation that it is, uh, told the laborers on the Panama Canal, thank you for your labor. No, thank you on the question of immigration. You cannot immigrate to the United States even though you have gotten used to US wages. That being said, a senator out of Missouri, um, yes, yeah, so a senator out of Missouri actually um, echoes this with a piece of legislation and he proposes an amendment to the larger immigration bill. He proposes this before the Senate in December 31st, 1914, just one month after the Panama Canal was finished. He was very eager to get this uh, piece of legislation approved in the Senate and to go to the House because the idea was that this Black and African population of the Caribbean, Central, and South America would try to immigrate to the United States directly after having worked on the Panama Canal, okay? Um, so he proposes a small amendment stating exclude anyone of the Black or African race from the United States forever. Um, not only would it exclude any one of the Black or African race, but it would put those individuals um, attempting who are Black or African in the same category as undesirables and criminals attempting to enter the United States. Booker T. Washington um, read the, well, let me say this before I get into it. Um, the, the measure passed. The, the amendment to the larger immigration bill passed in the Senate. It was proposed in the Senate by James Reed from Missouri. It passes in the Senate, pretty much like 29 to like zero, so very easily. With flying colors, it passed. With no opposition, no, no debate, just a very serious consensus that uh, the Senate is um, unified in not wanting there to be the, any immigration by African people from anywhere in the world into the United States from 1915 on. And yes, the completion of the Panama Canal was the impetus, but it would influence and impact immigration of anybody who was identifiably Black or African, and usually we're both, right? and uh, from coming anywhere in the world into the United States from 1915 on. So this is a hundred and um, what, six years ago, seven years ago now, 
at the beginning of this year, 107 years ago, because this happens in 1915. So uh, it passes in the Senate. It is due to go to the House of Representatives the first week in January, 1915. And it is Booker T. Washington, none other than Booker T. Washington, who would challenge this racist measure to exclude any one of the black race or from Africa, identifiably black or otherwise from excluding anyone and putting that same very group of people in the same category as undesirables or criminals attempting to enter the country. Uh, he would use, I tell the story of how he does this. He would use the Tuskegee machine. He would use the black press and he would maneuver and, and pretty much said that he was going to do whatever it took to uh, eliminate this racist and unfair measure. Let me be very clear. This measure did not impact him. Okay, this impacted African people coming from anywhere in the world, regardless of nationality. Uh, there's sometimes a myth amongst African people, Black people in the Caribbean, that in the United States, there's so somewhat of a preference for them. That's not true. This speaks to that simple fact. Um, in the case, I give you some of the dialogue on the floor of the House of Representatives as they debate this issue of um, African immigration. Uh, and it is very direct, okay? It is very pointed. Um, uh, I'll read just the, how the chapter opens, which is Booker T. Washington's words in the Black press regarding this particular case. And he airs them out. He exposes their political plans, the goings on in the Senate and in the House um, to the public to say, hey, we cannot allow this to happen. And so he is challenging US politicians and policy on behalf of African people everywhere. This case, this measure and its defeat by Washington is the only reason why anybody who is black or looks or is African can come into the United States today. It is the very reason Marcus Garvey uh, is able to come into the United States just one year and two months after that, because Jamaica is mentioned by name in this instance, okay, in particular. So let me just read just a little bit to you all, and then I'll be sharing that. It says, the, the, through your newspaper, this is Booker T. Washington writing in, uh, in the, let me see, What paper is this? Oh no, okay, so this is from a personal correspondence. He says, through your newspaper, I desire to appeal to the American Congress and the people of the United States in favor of fair play and justice in connection with the immigration bill now pending before the United States Senate. I and mean, this is right before the Senate passes it which by amendment excludes from coming into this country any person of African descent. And you notice he uses the term African because he understands that that covers all black people, right? Well, once again, Dr. Clark said, black is how we look, but it doesn't tell you who we are. African is who we are, okay? And, um, and so the United States government is really using the word African to address all of us. Um, and, and it's not conflicted. Now, fortunately today, then and now, we have many African people in the Caribbean, Central and South America, and even within the United States. Um, when you say African, they do not think you're talking about them, but we are African, okay? Black is a distinct and uh, characteristic Right, it is a um, it is a marker in the context of the construction of race, but we know that race is pathology. Race is not real. 
It is not scientifically proven. It is a social construct imposed on us by another group of people. And so we use the term race and we use the term black in order to identify each other in the context of the system. But in reality, um, that's not necessarily who we are, right? We are African people scattered abroad and Washington is very clear on that. And so when he writes this in the public realm, he's saying that this is this, the Senate is producing a, an amendment which excludes from coming into this country any person of African descent, okay? Um, so this is something that uh, the Senator and I'm reading straight from the congressional record, which is also in this case in the book. Um, this is a Senator Reed talking about who he wants to lock out. And this is a quote straight from the congressional record. We are beginning to receive now some undesirable immigration of the African race from the West Indies. A great many Jamaican Negroes have been employed upon the Panama Canal and after the termination of the work having become accustomed to American wages, which they receive down in Panama. A great many more of them begin to come to the Gulf ports, Florida and Louisiana have already received a considerable proportion of African immigration from the French and West and English West Indies. That is to say immigration of West Indians who are wholly or partly African and race, okay? So, and you're gonna have this uh, chapter, both these chapters, which are the chapters uh, in this book on both cases. Um, it, it exhibits, so, you know, I don't try to bend this course to be all about my particular book, but this is the definitive reason why we can call Booker T. Washington a Pan-Africanist, because it is this case that he defeats, right? Imagine, I won't give you the details. I'll give you something to be excited about. You can read the details of how he defeats this case by using the Tuskegee machine and propagandizing in the public realm. It's an interesting and epic story. Um, but uh, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, I don't make the whole course about this, but this is why we can call Washington a Pan-Africanist. Had he failed to defeat this measure, Marcus Garvey would not have entered the United States a year later. We would not have an Nkrumah who comes to the United States and becomes educated amongst African-Americans and goes to a black school, Lincoln University, and then goes to the University of Pennsylvania and then returns back to Ghana and leads his country to independence. We wouldn't have an Ezekwe, you know, from uh, Nigeria. We would not have had a fella who comes into <laughs> the United States and learns jazz, studies social music as it is really called. And, um, and jazz is what Europeans imposed on it, but social music is what African people in the United States called jazz. That's what we called it. And return back to Nigeria and create the genre of Afrobeat. You wouldn't have had once again, our beloved Malcolm X, whose mother was in fact from the Caribbean. Uh, and so we would not have had our Malcolm X born in the United States, the champion he was for our human rights. Uh, we would not have had, uh, well, some of you, I said this on another interview I did about this case, you would not have had your Barack Obama, if that means anything to you. <laughs> who was born from a father from Kenya who comes to the United States and meets his mother and produces him. On and on and on and on and on. I mean, we can give so many examples of how the coalescing of African people in the night into the United States and coalescing with other African people within the night United States has produced um, a great cadre of leadership and um, a lot of productive energy and organizing efforts that have impacted us globally. And so in this instance, what you should study is the posture because Washington does defeat the African exclusion measure. That's right, KT, 
Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael. He would not have come into the United States from Trinidad, nor would his parents have. Um, so, and, and I'm from the All African People Revolutionary Party. So, you know, that means a great deal to me that we would not have had a Stokely Carmichael uh, Kwame Ture in the United States, uh, who was a productive force and, and um, in the civil rights movement. A lot of people don't know about the fact that many of the people who end up becoming pro major proponents of the Black Power Movement were in fact some of the biggest um, activists in the civil rights movement. Let me say it again. Some of the people who made the biggest contributions to the civil rights movement would go on to be proponents of Black, black power and Black nationalism. Stokely Carmichael, AKA Kwame Ture, uh, is one of them. Nobody did more with King and voting rights as uh, Kwame Ture. That's right. <laughs> um, and yet he wasn't down with voting in America. He could really could care less, but he was down with organizing African people where we were. And so if the cause was to organize us around voting so that we could then do something else, that's what he was for. So um, I, I, I've fail to make those connections, not for myself, but for other people, you know, um, that uh, exactly, uh, who don't get it, the connection and the linkage between, you know, uh, people like, like Kwame Ture and Martin Luther King, who you can see them on many occasions walking arm in arm, but are very ideologically different, very different ideologically, okay? Um, that being said, we have a whole long list of African people who are the product of the coalescing between Africans in the United States and African people abroad. Um, and so this is the posture when these European nations try to marginalize and lock us out, okay, from the, any country. This is how you should be moving, right? If the UK did this, if it's some other some Central or South American country did this, you know. Uh, this is the posture one should assume on defense and on behalf of African people worldwide. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there. I'm going to share the cases. I'm going to, while I do that, while I share the cases, I'll take Q and A um, and I'll wrap it up. I'm getting better at this in terms of last cycle and many other cycles before this, I know we're close to being on time. <laughs> Meaning like, I'm just like, you know, I'm on a roll and you can't stop me. I'm not even thinking about stopping. It's like one o'clock and I'm like, oh, maybe I should stop. But I want to hear from you all what you thought about the chapter you did read. If you have any questions, if I could provide any clarity. And once again, just to leave this final point, why do we study this? Why do we study history? We always study history because history is instructive. It gives us instructions and it gives us prescription about things that we're facing now. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've already had a long list of ancestors who laid down various strategies and tactics to wage struggle, right? Harry Belafonte would not be in the United States for sure, okay? Many of them, many, 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 many of our notable people would not have been in the United States had it not been for Washington defeating this measure. Um, but we are involved in something that is not new. We are using technology to, um, leveraging technology to fight white supremacy and culture. However, we are on a continuum. We are in the struggle. We are involved in a continuous struggle for respect of our humanity, our freedom, and our rights to walk this earth fully as human beings, okay? And um, yeah, so, 
it's important for us to understand that because it is a challenge to do the work that you're doing. It is a challenge um, to um, hold on a second. It is a challenge to do the work that you're doing. And it is a challenge to be consistent with it. And so I think that does, what we're studying is the concrete evidence, right? That allows you to be reaffirmed in the work that you're doing, right? So um, that's the main thing. Let me, so you guys can talk to me through chat. I don't know if you, Yvonne, do you want to read some of it to me so I can like listen to the questions? How are you going, Fonte? Yes. Are there any questions? Because why, why I want you to do that, Yvonne, is so that I can post these things while I get some of the questions. So if you have any questions right now. Okay, somebody said they're trying to get in touch with me. Hi, Dr. I've been trying to link up with you, but in vain, I'm grateful for today. Oh, thank you. Um, is there, uh, direct message me in here and tell me why you're trying to con connect with me. I mean, besides this reason right here. Um, <laughs> um, that's to Patrick, I'm saying. And then Patrick, uh, do you have my email address? Even though I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm so horrible with those kind of things. Um, Great, from Liberia. Post questions, folks, if you have questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Manuel. He's running out of time. Oh, no. So that must be for Nana Akua. He had a question. Yes, there oh, okay. okay, so there's no questions, right? Yes. I don't see any questions. All right, yeah, that's a good thing. So let me just um, locate uh, the readings. And you guys have a couple of minutes that if you, uh, that if you want to ask any questions while I'm finished. Uh, WhatsApp on my computer for a long time. So it's really kind of funny because I just started using a WhatsApp on my computer, which allowed me to do more things while I'm teaching you. Uh, but I made a mistake and I closed all of it. <laughs> okay, here we go. WhatsApp. Let me open it up. I just hope that it lets me do that without a problem. If not, I'll be posting everything right after we get off because um, I feel like it's more beneficial for me to do it that way for you to get. Oh, uh, okay. Oh yeah. Um. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I did, Damani, and I'm gonna follow up with you. Okay. I'm going to follow up with you. I promise. I saw the email. It's just sometimes hard. Sometimes I'm driving. I can't, I see things and then I just can't like really respond at that moment. And then it escapes me, but I'm going to come back to it today. Uh, yeah. So somebody, what is this a recording of Crystal? It's a recording of what meeting? Yes, you can send it to me. Okay, I'm gonna send you a message right now with my email address. And folks, the reason why I don't send up, put my email address in here, because like I just said, I'm really bad with communicating via email. Sometimes at the end of the session, I'll um, connect my, let give people my, um, you know, I'll open my Facebook page so that folks can communicate with me there um, in Messenger. Because actually I'm better. I have so many email addresses that 
it is sometimes problematic to maintain. I have to maintain my work emails, but I'm not necessarily good at that either. <laughs> right? Right. So, you know, it's it's like a whole thing, this like communicating via social media. Let me hold on. Let me see. Um, it's just Tyrene Wright, my Facebook thing and then you can send me a request to be a friend but what I'll do is I don't think it's open right now but I will open it up at the end of the session so people can send it back to me so Christoph I'm sending you my email address just make sure that you put um and and that is correct dr at the beginning of that okay uh even though it looks like it's not highlighted there um okay and then someone have a question and my question is how can we stop this or what is the way for it? Cause stop what white supremacy and culture? Yes, white supremacy and culture. Well, one of the ways we can stop it is what we're doing, what you're doing here. You're developing yourself ideologically to do the work of what I Love Black People is all about, which is eradicating racism and xenophobia so that we can live fuller and freer lives and invoke our right to move freely around the world without uh, compromise to our integrity and compromised. Um... Hold on. Uh, to use WhatsApp on your computer, open WhatsApp on your phone. Tap menu center, consider device okay so yeah i mean this is part of it one second folks i've got to like to get into the whatsapp group i've got a uh <laughs> i've got to um okay your search do not match oh Anyway, I don't know what I closed my um I closed my WhatsApp on the uh, the computer and now it's giving me a problem about getting back in. Okay, well, I'll I'll do it. So I'll I'll be posting the documents right after this session. I'm not going to worry about it right this second. But um I'm gonna be posting the documents. I just tried to do it, but it's not letting me do it. So I have to wait till I get off and I can just focus right on that, okay? Um, but you'll get it. So those two chapters, the Liberian crisis and the African exclusion measure from this book is what you'll be getting that from, okay? Um, let's see, is there any other questions, comments, problems, issues? Okay, good. Make sure you put, okay. Oh, did you order the book, uh, Christoph? Did you order the Booker T. Washington in Africa book recently? Answer in the uh, general thing or just answer here in the chat. Because I had somebody who ordered the book from France and I need to talk to that person. I don't have it on here. I have to ask. Um, someone who deals with that, but I, I saw that someone who ordered the book from France. Anyway, okay. All right. Well, Christoph, you can send me, I sent you my email address. You can write me, just put, you know, who you are in the subject. Okay. So how can we stop this? I mean, I think you're on your path. Uh, who is that? And And Sewer, Dewa, okay. I think you're on the right path. I mean, it takes us, the masses of the people to really actually do the work. It's not gonna come from like individual leadership and stuff like that. They're already thoroughly co-opted. There's gotta be a shift in the consciousness amongst the people on the ground because we actually have the power and we have the power to influence each other and then what happens is, is that 
you know, certain things become outmoded and intolerable when the people don't go for it anymore, right? This is how, and I'm going to get to African liberation um, on the continent of Africa, but this is how Africa takes its uh, continent back, a, a sort of consciousness. In two years' time, 1962 to 1963, 17 African nations will struggle and rip their uh, independence, take their independence back from European nations sometimes even with being at a disadvantage, material disadvantage. Um, it's what happens after that neo-colonialism that harms us just as much because now we have leadership that looks like us but carries out somebody else's agenda, you know? Um, and so now we've got to sharpen our tools. It's not enough for us to be able to impact the material reality and, and the, the image of things, meaning our nation, our land and the possession of uh, imperialists. But we've also have to be able to impact um, the politics and the economics, because what you have now is that African nations have African leaders, but they are serving the interest of other people. One of the things that's so horrible about white supremacy and culture is that fundamentally it gets us to go against our own best interest and it gets other people who look like us, who we think are family, to go against our own best interests for their individual benefit. And so in this course, we, we're going to, this is why we look at the two cases that I'm talking about today and that you'll be reading this week because we get to qualify the behavior. Somebody can run all around and say that they're all for us, but then at the end of the day, if we're not able to weigh and measure what we actually got out of the deal, then that, mean was, that means it was not to our benefit. And we need to be very astute and even um, rigid in analyzing that, okay? Because all too often we settle for symbolism and we can't eat symbolism. We can't live in symbolism. We can't uh, travel the world with symbolism, right? Uh, we can't cover ourselves in symbolism when we need so many material things and we need so many, um, so much development in terms of social consciousness um, around um, respecting our humanity. So those things are not um, intangible. So those things are very tangible. And so we can never settle for symbols, right? And that's what a lot of this stuff has us doing, right? Okay. Well, nice meeting us. I mean, nice hanging in there, you are. D-Way, I know I'm not pronouncing your name right. I'm sorry. Uh, Yeah, don't, if you're international, do not order the book though, okay? I'm going to give, share the, some of the most critical parts of the book in here and you will have it for free. Um, it's very hard to get the book to people overseas, but the next book, which is coming out in May, um, it'll be easier because it's going to be an ebook format and it'll be on the other platforms that people can download. Okay. Hold on, so uh, this book is French. Okay, thank you. Let me see if I can capture that. Did you send that to me in the email, um, Krista? Okay. <laughs> Great, Maria Jones. Who is that, Maria Jones? Oh, I don't know if you can turn off the mic. Are you you're, are you related to me? Because my mother's family name is Jones, Maria Jones. Uh, 
Okay. I will share, I will open up. I mean, Messenger on, on Facebook is the same thing, Tyreen, right? But I don't know if you can find me publicly right now. So I have to make it so you can search me and, and friend me. Okay. I think that's it, folks, though. But so wait, before the end of the day is out, you'll have those two chapters. Sorry, I couldn't post it on here because it wasn't letting me do it. It wasn't letting me scan the um, QR code with my phone, I think, because I'm on, okay? So I apologize for that. I really have uh, decided that this is the way to go, do everything in real time. Uh, so that's it. Uh, oh, okay. Uh-huh, wonderful. Don't say anything unless she says it. <laughs> Maria Jones is Mary Baraka's daughter. Okay, welcome. Welcome, so happy to have you on here. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, I wasn't supposed to say that. Okay, sorry, I'm slow. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. So send all of that to me, Christoph, and my thing. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, wow, wonderful from Liberia. Okay, okay, no problem, Nathaniel. Thank you for being here and staying to the end. Um, and so I'm glad we're in Q&A right now because I feel guilty for going over. But okay, thank you, Baba Dimani. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, so I'll be sharing those two chapters from this book, as you guys can see. And then we'll be going on to the rest of, thank you, to the rest of the um readings and studies um for the course and we so we've done like the individual history of pan you know the history of pan-africanism we're creating that time now we're looking at evidentiary chapters so you can get some idea of like what it is on concrete level what pan-africanism is in motion right and what we should come away with because it's always something you know that song give me something you can feel okay so we want something we can feel we don't want to walk away hand, empty-handed it is not pan-africanism we walk away empty-handed right so that's why a lot of people talk about pan-africanism but what does it produce for us but if it didn't produce anything for us then it is not pan-africanist in nature right and and we'll get further and further than that as, as we go along thank you um, then, uh, so you're looking at the two evidentiary chapters and I, I will just briefly sum them up when we come back and we'll be talking about them in the context of the WhatsApp groups. You will get them before the end of the day um, in WhatsApp. And then as we move forward, we're gonna be looking at individual proponents of Pan-Africanism and then large bodies, large organizations that are Pan-Africanist in nature, okay? And what they did and how they organized because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to improve it, right? It's been done for us um, and, and we just have to improve upon it and implement it, okay? So that's it for now. It is 12.59 where I'm at. So almost one o'clock on the dot and I'm gonna end and bid you all farewell stay well for the week i will see you back here next weekend we'll be talking in the groups and um i am because we are okay peace okay make sure i see those last comments thank you i right, thank you so much for preparing right thank you. lecture
We really appreciate it. We appreciate okay, it. Thank you all. Maria, Maria Jones, uh, uh, Jones, Jones, Loretta, you. Uh, we appreciate all of you. Clyde Fowler, John Agaba. I can't mention all of you, but we do appreciate you. We love you all. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Um, hopefully, we'll be together next week. I am because we yes. are with you. Yeah, we will. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Peace and love. Peace.